you for tuning in. In these, let's call them interesting times, we're grateful for the opportunity to invite virtual audiences together to share ideas and creativity, even when we're not exactly, you know, coming together. And so I'd especially like to thank Anthony Townsend for helping us keep the conversation aloft here at Town Hall and on a Sunday night, no less. Tonight's presentation will be around 30 minutes, followed by a Q&A. Afterwards, the program, uh, I should say the program, uh, can be viewed on its na native habitat here on Crowdcast, as well as on our Facebook and YouTube pages. To watch with closed captioning, go over to YouTube, where you can enable real-time captions by clicking the CC button in the bottom right corner. The video will also be available for rewatching immediately following the broadcast. Uh, note, though, you'll have to submit your questions using the Ask a Question button on Crowdcast. And although we cannot guarantee that we'll get to every question, we'll try to get to as many as possible tonight. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs around science and society include Attorney General Bob Ferguson, Tom Mueller, and Tom Carpenter discussing the essential role that whistleblowers have played in ensuring any kind of safety at the Hanford nuclear site. Vivian Lee with a fresh look at the likelihood of healthcare reform. Uh, the final installment in this year's edition of our Engage UW Science Series, featuring reports directly from UW's labs, and just announced a benefit event called Tomorrow Will Be Better If, featuring live music and responses to that prompt from a diverse list, including Lieutenant Governor Cyrus Habib, KEXP's John Richards, UW President Adamir Mari Kause, uh, Dr. James Olson from Fred Hutch, DJ Riz Rollins, and virologist Alex Greninger, among many others. Meanwhile, you'll also find many past events available in our di digital media library, which is kind of a memory hole, really, for life as it used to be, you know, February. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Uh, our Arno Matulski Science Series is supported by Microsoft, KUOW, the Wincote Foundation Northwest, and the taxpayers of Washington State. Um, but as most of you know, Town Hall is fundamentally a member-supported organization, and I want to sincerely thank all of our members in the audience tonight. And on that point, with the many recent event cancellations, Town Hall, like other nonprofits, is under dramatic financial strain. If you made a donation on the way into the live stream tonight, we thank you, and we hope you will all consider supporting us during this time by using the donate button at the bottom of your screen or by becoming a member through our website. You can also give by texting the words Town Hall to the number 44321. So many ways to give. One final point of economic data. Our partner booksellers have been hit by the negative effects of the COVID outbreak as well and can use your support too. Tonight's event around Ghost Road will likely only inspire more interest in this provocative issue. So if you're interested in supporting local independent bookstores and going deeper on the issues uh, Anthony presents, uh, pick up a copy of the book using the button um, to purchase through Third Place Books. We hope you'll do that tonight. All right then, Anthony Townsend is an internationally recognized expert on the future of cities and information technology. He's a senior research scientist at NYU's Rudin Center for Transportation Policy and Management, where he supervises research on the impact of information and communication technologies on mobility, land use, and transportation planning. He also teaches a course on intelligent cities in NYU's urban planning program. Townsend is a member of the inaugural class of fellows at the, at the newly founded, which I guess is redundant, isn't it? Let's say the inaugural class of fellows at the Data and Society Research Institute based in New York City. His fellowship research focuses on the emergence of a new urban science assessing the current influx of new funding, talent, data, and ideas into the field of urban studies, as well as the impact of research uh, of this research on local government and the role of citizens in the research itself. His writing can be found in Scientific American and Stanford Social Innovation Review, among other publications. And he is the author of 2013's Smart Cities, Big Data, Civic Hackers, and the Quest for a New Utopia, which was the occasion of his last visit to Town Hall. That's the actual physical Town Hall, that is. His latest book, Ghost Road, Beyond the Driverless Car, is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Anthony Townsend. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining me tonight. Um, it's been a tumultuous 48, 96 hours in the country. Um, you know, and uh, I really appreciate your attention, uh, given all the other distractions. Uh, that said, though, feel free, you know, to monitor Twitter, CNN, uh, you know, whatever, whatever else you have running in the other window, um, because uh, there's a lot going on that needs to be paid attention to. And I, I fully understand the distraction. Um, you know, one of the things that's been really jarring launching this book into the pandemic has been, um, you know, just the need to sort of re-examine 
uh, all the conclusions and all the evidence because the book was written over the course of the last three years. Um, and thankfully, uh, you know, I think I've done a pretty good job as a forecaster and um, a lot of um, the things that have been fast forwarded at us uh, you know, from the future in the last couple of months, namely around um, the increase in uh, delivery to homes uh, is something that, um, you know, really, uh, I think came, came on very quickly. Um, but, you know, in the last week, uh, we've basically seen the future kind of vanish. So I think we're in this really, really weird period um, for forecasting where, you know, the future's coming at us fast or it's just, you know, coming to a total standstill. Um, so it's, it's going to be, you know, a really weird conversation um, to talk about technology sort of as this abstract thing. But I think, you know, what we can do is just sort of keep drawing it back to um, what's important, big picture, um, and, and also, you know, what's going on right now, because there, there are some connections. So I'll, I'll do my best to do that um, as we go through. So let me just uh, hop over to uh, the keynote presentation I put together. There's going to be quite a bit of video in this. Um, so long as you can see the main images, you know, I think you'll get the gist of, of uh, what I'm talking about. It's really just to create some, some flavor uh, to, to the presentation as opposed to, um, you know, being the main focal point. So if you don't see every frame of the video, don't fret. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll explain what's going on. So, I think just the, the place to start with this um, is to really understand, um, you know, what, what is it that uh, Silicon Valley and to a lesser extent, um, Detroit and all the other auto manufacturing centers around the world have been telling us is uh, coming our way uh, in the form of, of driverless uh, mobility. And um, for the most part, it has been driverless cars. And um, you know, this is really going on 10 years now since uh, Google uh, unveiled their stealth project, the Google self-driving car. Uh, it would actually be 10 years ago th this October uh, when they unveiled it. Um, and what's most fascinating is that this is, a, this is an old idea. What you're looking at, um, is a film from 1956. Uh, it was GM's uh, vision of the future called Motorama. And what you're seeing is basically like a fictional uh, representation of a system that RCA actually developed uh, that uh, would have um, basically it's a camera following a painted line um, along, along the road. There are other variants of this that followed a, uh, a guide wire laid down in the concrete. Um, there were cost estimates done at the time of you know what it would cost to fit the interstate highway system with this kind of kind of uh, capability. Same kinds of things people were talking about with driverless technology today, and it, you know it wasn't pursued really because the market demand wasn't there. Uh, people wanted to drive, um, even though it could be a drag sometimes. It was still a new thing. It was still fun. It still made made people feel like you know they were in control. And it was still the thing that sold automobiles. What's funny is that, you know, the visions that you see of automated mobility, um, this is a Tesla uh, product video. You know, in many ways, they're not that different. Um, and in fact, Tesla's product, their driverless um, car product, Autopilot, uh, is actually um, taken from the video I just showed you. They've basically borrowed um, a brand name that uh, GM had developed 50 years previously. So, you know, th there's so much, so much of this is, is sort of the fulfillment of a dream that the auto industry has had uh, for, you know, close to 60 or 70 years now, but didn't really have the technology um, to, to, to deliver. And in fact, it's actually like a much, much, much older dream than that. If you look, um, you know, every, almost every mythic tradition on the planet um, you go back and there is some hero or king or god who's whizzing around, you know, often in the sky, but just as often on the ground, 
Uh, sometimes it's C. The Norse, you know, have a, a, a god, Fry, who has what's you know, basically a self-driving sailboat. Um, uh, King Morgan, the generous, uh, in Wales, who is a mythic character, had a chariot that he could teleport around the British Isles. And um, a lot of you know Chinese emperors and myths are in flying thrones. Of course, as you see here, the flying carpet. My favorite is the Slavic myth of Baba Yaga, who um, those of you who have played Dungeons and Dragons may remember she makes an appearance in, in that game world, um, who runs around the steppes of Eastern uh, Eurasia in a magical hut that's carried along by two chicken legs. Um, so this idea of self-driving, self-propelled vehicles is a very, very old technological longing. And we're just now you know, making it possible. Um, so this is coming, we're finally fulfilling this dream at the same time that we are achieving really a full and total urbanization of the planet. Um, this is an often cited statistic sort of trend in urban planning circles that, uh, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, the world was about, sorry, at the middle of the 20th century, the world was about 50% urban. By the end of the 21st century, we'll be about 100% urban. Um, you know, this is just a phenomenal phase of city building. Um, and uh, it's creating tremendous challenges for mobility um, and, and uh, you know, really making solutions that have, have sort of worked for a while, like private single passenger automobiles, obsolete. And there's just a huge search for new solutions. The demos of um, driverless vehicles or autonomous vehicles or self-driving vehicles. Um, and I think one of the things that I deal with very early on in the book are these words that we use and, and what they mean and what they're trying to achieve. Um, you know, these, these, these demos are really, really compelling. Um, so uh, this is Google's self-driving car video. I'm gonna play it again real quick just so you can see. You know, they're basically, they're basically saying like, you know, this is a car that's gonna keep grandma or, you know, a visually impaired person, or, you know, they didn't put kids in these, unattended children in these, but I think for a lot of <clears throat> stressed out parents trying to get kids to all the different activities, like this was, hey, here's like a car to shuttle, a robo car to shuttle your kids safely around so you don't have to do it. Um, and, and I think, you know, they were really testing the waters here to see if this is like the next um, great product that they could, they could deliver to, to the masses. Um, and, you know, I think, again, this is like, it ought to be compelling by now because the technical work to create these things has been going on for close to 50 years. Um, these are, uh, this is the uh, Mercedes um, self-driving van uh, from the 80s, you know, which, which uh, had a bunch of computers in the back, you know, which would, which would probably fit in like one corner of the inside of your iPhone now. And this was the first, uh, this was the first self-driving vehicle to, to really drive itself on a road across the country, uh, almost fully under computer control using computer vision to, you know, interpret imagery of, of the road and traffic and safely navigate around it. Um, and, you know, we've really picked up the pace since then. Uh, so in the last two or three years, we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars spent uh, on automated driving, uh, you know, just dwarfing what we think of as, as like a, a huge, very R&D driven industry like uh, aerospace. Um, if anybody didn't catch the Crew Dragon SpaceX launch yesterday, um, it's, it was pretty exciting. Um, you know, a bit of a uh, distraction from, from the bad news. Um, the thing, though, is, is, you know, this has been both commercially exciting, technologically exciting, been kind of a slow burn um, and, and slow to, to come to fruition. Uh, but, you know, what we've seen is, is as the promise and the hype of automated driving has, has grown, uh, that the, the letdowns and the failures have also grown sort of equally, um, equally spectacular. And, you know, we've, we've seen videos, uh, like you'll see this self-driving Uber come in from the right of the screen and sort of blow through 
uh, this red light in downtown San Francisco. Um, you know, there were fatal accidents involving both Uber self-driving vehicles and, and Teslas. Um, and, you know, this is something that uh, I think is really um, endemic to the testing of this technology is that it is going to fail. Uh, all automated systems fail. And because we re rely so heavily on automobiles, um, you know, there are going to be many failures. And so the reckoning um, that's associated with that has, it has kind of given people pause about whether this is going to be as great as we've been promised. So I think, you know, I don't write that much about the safety issues around automated vehicles in the book because I'm, I'm pretty much of the school of thought that if automated vehicles aren't safe, there won't be an AV industry. Um, that it's really an engineering problem that the industry has to solve and potentially can self-regulate itself. Um, I'm more interested in, um, you know, the, the other problems uh, around the fact that it isn't really cars that we need to fix. We need to fix urban mobility more broadly. And, you know, the fact that the way we travel has changed so much. Uh, we go different places. We travel at different times of day. We travel in groups. We have different desires in terms of how much we pay and, um, you know, the, the impact of our, our travel uh, among multiple dimensions, our own personal health, environmental health, traffic, and so on. Um, and so mobility has become much more complicated than simply uh, purchasing a consumer product. It's more about, about consuming a whole range of mobility services. So, you know, what does this all add up to? Um, there is a supply and demand at work. Um, it's clear that the um, business case for, for automation uh, is growing. It's gonna be a bit of a slow burn for the next few years. Um, you know, this, this will have to get adjusted depending on how, um, you know, the, <laughs> the next Great Depression works out. But, um, you know, this is kind of a classic technology diffusion curve that things start slowly and they build and build and build. It's kind of like a virus, actually. Um, you know, people come into contact with others who have, you know, who have or have used technology and can explain or demonstrate the benefits of it. And, um, you know, others see that and decide they want to acquire it for themselves. There are also network effects. Uh, you know, the more of these that are out there, the fleets become more and more useful and the spread accelerates. So, you know, I think by 2030, um, we'll definitely be seeing these things out on the streets on a regular basis, um, in some places faster than others. And, um, you know, uh, in some uses faster than those. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's really important that, again, it's not going to necessarily be automobiles that we first encounter this technology of automated driving in. So, you know, if you're waiting for David Hasselhoff and Kit to roll up, um, you know, in your neighborhood, you're going to be pretty, pretty disappointed. Um, I think, you know, I'm going to skip past this one because it's kind of out of sequence. So um, I think that the, the point of the, the, the book really is to break out of this very simplistic narrative that uh, automated driving means we're going to perfect the car and that the, um, the future of automated mobility you know, it's basically what we saw in Minority Report. It's little individual pods moving in synchronization along uh, traffic-free highways in perfect safety. Um, you know, it's going to be different. It's going to be weirder. It's going to be woollier. Um, and, you know, I really think we need some new myths of, of driverless technology um, to help us understand what the future could be like. And that's, that's what I, I set out to do with the book. Um, let's see. And so the book's really organized around, uh, oh, this is actually gonna be of interest to you guys. So the, the cover of Ghost Road uh, was actually a painting by Mary Iverson, who 
lives in uh, the Pacific Northwest, I think in the Seattle area. Um, I didn't source the art, um, the publisher sourced the art, but I had become quite a fan of her since they selected it. Um, and uh, she's, um, her style is to uh, kind of <clears throat> juxtapose, you know, natural beauty and images of infrastructure and, and logistics and globalization. So she'll often do these things like this, where it's kind of like this, and the reason I picked this one from the choices they gave me, it's like, you know, almost like the, uh, the, the dawn of life scene, you know, at the beginning of, of time on earth juxtaposed with, you know, this grid of, of, of data representing, um, you know, the, the sort of the way the computer might see the world, the new aesthetic. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's just, it's a really sublime way of understanding, you know, what this, this thing, um, this metaphor, Ghost Road actually is. And to me, um, you know, Ghost Road, I'm not even 100% sure what it is. Um, it's kind of, a, it's kind of a, a, a challenge. It's kind of a provocation. I think it is, um, it's a placeholder that I want to put in your head um, of, you know, a, a future where um, when we go out into um, the spaces where we move about that, you know, we're the minority um, and machines are, are in control um, and, and often <clears throat> alienating, often, um, you know, maybe individually working for us uh, but collectively not, um, and, you know, trying to, um, raise the possibility that they, you know, things may get out of control. Um, and we have to, we have to be vigilant against that. Um, so anyway, that's, that's enough about that. I think, um, you know, you'll, you'll figure out what the ghost road is if you uh, dig into the book, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a mysterious place. Um, so the three big stories um, that I think will give it some shape, I'm just going to run through these real quick, and then we can we can open. Um, the first is what I call specialism, and this is this is really an answer to you know, if not perfecting the automobile, perfecting the car, you know, then what? Um, and oh yeah, so I, I talked about Minority Report. You know, this is this is to me what like. I think Elon Musk and maybe some of the folks at GM and, and some of the German car companies, like when they fantasize about the future of automated driving, this is, this is what they envision. It's a city that's been once again, re-rationalized around high-speed individual transportation. Um, and it's got lots of expensive, high-precision manufactured products in it that will keep them busy for, for decades to come. Um, and again, I, I just I don't think that this is this is terribly plausible, given the direction that, that things are going. Um, you know, and again, I, I poke back through the past, um, and uh, it, it's it's remarkable how how durable and misleading some of these um, images of the future were. This was actually an ad from the 1950s um, that uh, was run by a consortium of electric power utilities. And you know this is this is a future of automated driving, but it's it's like a future that never was. I guess is the way I think of it. Um, they're on a road. There's no traffic. There's no. There's not even any um, commercial vehicles on this road. It's all private passenger vehicles. There's no cities or buildings of any kind. I mean, where where are these people going? They're not even in a city. Um, so. You know, this is just a totally unrealistic way of thinking about our own future. Yet this this image shows up. So this this ran in Life and Time magazine, like in the mid '50s. So like, you know, your grandparents may have may have opened a magazine and seen this. Uh, and this is what they may still think a driverless car is. Um, it, this shows up in every venture capitalist, every entrepreneur's presentation. And sometimes they'll sort of be making a joke about it. But often they look at it and say, yeah, we've always thought this was the future. Isn't it great that it's finally here? And I just find that, I just find that so ridiculous. Um, and the reason I find it ridiculous is that the number of, um, and the 
kinds of automated vehicles that are already in existence are just multiplying. So, you know, the moment we're in is more kind of like um, this massive explosion of species that has happened at various times in the evolution of life, where we're finding that this capability allows all different kinds of forms to emerge that can that can capitalize upon it. Um, and so a lot of the book, um, or a good part of the beginning of the book is just going through and, and naming these things, driverless shuttles um, or teeny weeny French buses. For some reason, the French have cornered the market on these things. Um, and, and it's a good story and it's, it's worth, worth reading. Um, and it has a lot to do with a different style of innovation in, in Europe and then in Silicon Valley. Um, uh, you know, IDEO and others have, uh, architects have started to explore the question of what does it mean, you know, if we, if we put this into things that are basically small buildings and start to move them around. This is an idea in architecture that, you know, goes back to the 60s. Um, if you've ever been to Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C., you've been on what is essentially a small self-driving building traveling in the mobile lounges between terminals, um, designed by Eero Saarinen, the famous architect. Um, but I mean, this is, sort of gives you a sense of just how far we're pushing, you know, the boundaries between vehicles and buildings may blur. Um, you know, this was a, a concept uh, in China, which um, I think is super relevant to what's going on now. The idea of self-driving pop-up stores that might bring the goods closer to you uh, if you can't get out and go down to get it. Um, you know, we may end up in a future where lots of shops close and our main streets die, but the retailing just moves to the corner. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe there's, there's some other configuration, not just everything going straight to the home. Uh, this is actually uh, a, um, a bit of a joke. Uh, this is an April Fool's prank uh, that Google's Amsterdam office uh, pulled, uh, this sort of visualization of a self-driving bike. Um, and I think they, it's a funny joke, and, but they sort of got the use case for the self-driving bike wrong. Uh, you know, imagining that people would do other things while they were riding the bike, like that people would let the bike drive itself. Um, I don't think that's what you would use a self-driving bike for. What you would use a self-driving bike for is to drive itself to the next customer, if it was a shared bike, or to drive itself to the charging point, or in a COVID world, to drive itself to the, to the disinfection station for the next user. With them on it that you want the automated driving capability. So I think it's, as we start to explore all the, the ways that automation will be useful in mobility, we're going to start to understand all the different ways that it's, uh, that it can create value and create new kinds of products and experiences. Uh, Singapore's, uh, you got a couple startups there that are playing around with scooters that basically, you know, come to you when you call. And there's a long way to go before this doesn't look like a kind of clunky gadget, but it shows you that entrepreneurs are, are starting to explore and it's going to move very, very quickly because these things can be prototyped and built quickly. Um, and uh, this is a category of um, self-driving vehicles that I call urban ushers because I think they're going to take the place of um, all of the street furniture, the signage, uh, potentially some of the people uh, and personnel who you know, watch over and provide services and direct um, and respond to things that happen on city streets and, you know, potentially do, do so in ways that are, you know, more effective, more comprehensive, maybe, you know, less brutal. I don't know if we could program a security bot to, to not discriminate against people or to not use excessive force, but, um, you know, it's certainly uh, an appealing possibility uh, right now, although it may create many more problems. This is kind of a ridiculous scenario that we see here, um, but it does start to, to help you understand 
uh, you know, again, even as we're blurring the boundary between like motor vehicles and buildings on one side, also blurring the boundary between motor vehicles and robotics on the other side. So these things are all going to sort of bl blur together. Um, and what we talk about as a robot, a car and a building may start to, to be difficult to distinguish from each other because they'll all be able to move and act on their own. And then, uh, you know, getting to, to the robotics piece, um, the ability to uh, create, um, you know, robots that use animal and human style locomotion um, is going to really <laughs> challenge our our assumptions about, you know, what a, a vehicle is and what a self-driving vehicle is and how that fits into our, our cities and what we, we might do with it. And some of these things just have tremendous capabilities. Um, this one doesn't even have any any kind of optical or electromagnetic sensors. It, it navigates and senses its world solely through what it picks up through its, its lens. Um, so uh, really just a tremendous amount of innovation. There's been a day that goes by that I don't learn about a new vehicle. Um, I'm going to the next, the other two big stories are just five minutes each, and then, and then we'll, we'll open it up. Um, materialization, this is probably the part of the book. It's the, it's the middle two chapters that is most relevant to what's happening right now in COVID. Um, and, uh, you know, when I was writing the book, I spent some time in Singapore, and Singapore is building a new central business district uh, called Jurong Newtown. And their baseline assumption is that for 2035, 65% uh, 6 of all retail purchases would be delivered to the home by automated uh, delivery vehicles. And, um, you know, if you take the automated part out, we have sort of fast forwarded pretty close to that now, you know, in a, in a matter of a couple of months. Um, you know, every, everywhere you look uh, in, in, in the online retail and shipping business, that's what they're saying. We've, we've leaped about five to 10 years ahead of, um, of where we expected to be. Um, they knew they were getting there. Um, of course, Amazon has been at the forefront of this, both you know, good and bad. Um, but boy, like <laughs> we didn't expect this to happen. And you know, I think the reason I call this materialization is it's like this just um, massive uh, uh, kind of wave of goods sweeping off the web and into city streets. And, and really the um, ability for automation to drive the cost of shipping down you know, another factor of 10 or two uh, in the years to come and unleashing uh, just, you know, that much more um, uh, movement uh, of, of goods around city streets. And the reason that's important is that it's not something that um, has gotten a lot of attention in, in the talk about driverless technology. We've focused almost exclusively on passenger Transportation. So none of those movies I showed from the 50s or even, you know, recently um, show goods moving around. Um, and I, I think much more attention needs to be to be paid to that. And cities don't really think about it very much. Um, so one of one of the things that um, has happened since, um, you know, the stay at home orders with COVID is just how flat footed cities have been caught, you know, really trying to understand um, you know, where are the bottlenecks for, for moving, um, moving more deliveries in and out? Um, and, you know, what do they need to do in order to respond to it? It's just not something they have a lot of capacity. Um, you know, a lot of these figures are kind of out of date now, but e-commerce has basically been growing about 15% a year for the last decade, which means every five years it doubles. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's just sort of on a steady uh, on a steady growth, um, you know, we've had this big bump, but it will now resume, you know, that, that growth at a, at a higher level. And it's just, it's, you know, you see things like this, like this is essentially, you know, a, a neighborhood uh, scale, like a uh, distribution center that has been ad hoc set up uh, on, on top of a bike sharing station in Manhattan, which I think is, is, you know, hilarious. And it really just shows you like the tremendous conflicts that are starting to emerge around the distribution of all these goods coming from, from essentially from a handful of online mega retailers like Amazon. 
The volumes are growing, the shipping times are speeding up. Automation really is the key um, to, to solving that. And, and in many ways, this is why I think it's so important, is that there aren't a lot of people that, are, that really need or are, are necessarily eager to have self-driving, fully self-driving cars right now. There are a lot of businesses that are eager to have it. Um, shipping costs are killing Amazon. They're killing everybody else that's trying to catch up with Amazon. This, this is, you know, this is an economic driver that dwarfs anything that we're seeing in the passenger passenger industry, where it's it's mostly just a lot of kind of old school companies that are like looking for like how can we make cars more attractive so people will keep buying them, um, and you know, even before COVID, this is the thesis I, I present in the book, is that this is going to be the thing that drives automation in, in the short term. Um, again, this is IDEO. This is a, you know, another example of all the, the variety uh, that's already on, on the roadmap around freight delivery. Um, and this is basically what we call a mule. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of what's in the book is like naming things that don't really have names yet. Um, what are we going to call these things? This is a mule. This comes in the morning to your street corner or your neighborhood or your building and it parks outside. It has all the deliveries for the day and it takes all the returns. You know, it eliminates dozens of dirty trucks running around your neighborhood, um, you know, scaring people who are trying to cross streets, uh, causing pollution, causing noise, and, uh, you know, helps create a better, better service experience as well. Um, these things uh, are starting to roll out um, essentially, you know, single delivery. Uh, I call them conveyors because they're kind of like um, conveyor, you know, buckets on a conveyor belt that is the sidewalk. Um, and they're designed for short, you know, less, less than a mile um, delivery, instant deliveries from restaurants and, um, and other local retailers to, to people's homes and, and, and offices. Uh, Milton Keynes in the United Kingdom, which is one of the last of the, the towns, um, uh, has had a very large demonstration of these for the last couple of years and uh, got a lot of attention because they've expanded it significantly uh, during uh, the COVID shutdowns. So I think this is, this is something that, um, you know, is potentially going to become much more commonplace. Of course, lots of conflicts with people on sidewalks and things like that, but um, you know, remains to be to be worked out. So I think it's just important to understand. Um, you know, if we're looking at passenger travel, we may be missing the boat. Um, I've been talking way too long, so I'm going to say one thing about this last trend. Uh, I just want to skip to the slide, and that is that um, automation has the potential to you know really drive a lot of investment. And a lot of innovation into transportation, uh, which is an area that has not had a lot of it in the last 50 years um, or even 100 years. But it's also going to connect uh, the essential systems that move people around cities and very powerful global financial interests in some incredibly murky and, and risky ways. Uh, SoftBank, which is uh, a large um, technology investment fund based in Japan, primarily um, staked by Saudi sovereign wealth uh, and, and Abu Dhabi sovereign wealth. Um, so this is, this is essentially like fossil fuel money, um, has been the, the single greatest in, investor in ride hail and has built um, you know, what I think of as, as, as a latter day traction monopoly, as they were called uh, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, uh, that controls 95% of the ride hail uh, business globally. Um, now, traction monopolies were a big deal in U.S. cities, and Seattle actually had one of the worst ones. Um, and these arose when uh, horse-drawn streetcars gave way to a new tech innovation, electric streetcars. And in a lot of cities, you had a situation where the streetcar company, which was the biggest consumer of electricity, the electric generating company, and the lighting utility, which is the second largest consumer of electricity, were all basically the same company, were controlled by the same interests. Um, 
And in different cities, this happened in many different cities, Seattle, Philadelphia, elsewhere, different cities responded differently. Um, Philadelphia sort of just kind of fell in line and let the, let the attraction trust kind of run the city into the ground. Um, it's one of the reasons Philadelphia doesn't have a very large subway network, never really built out the way New York did because the, the trust wouldn't let them do it. They wanted people on the streetcars. Um, Seattle actually, I believe it was in the midst of the First World War, um, basically took over the whole system um, and still owns uh, the, uh, the power utility part of it today. So I think, you know, um, the, the important thing here is that automation is, is really going to create, as it has in, in the, the online world and on social media and all these other things, tremendous consolidation of, of control and power. And it's something that cities are going to have to watch out for as, as we move forward. So I'm going to stop there. This has been like a tremendous amount of um, stuff. I hope um, some of it uh, is, is interesting for us to dig into. I'm going to close my, um, my screen share and pop over to the question window. And let's see what we have. Okay, uh, so um, there's a question from David Terry Durace. Um, All mass transit and highways and public works transportation infrastructure will be rethought or redesigned post pandemic. Your thoughts? As by retired traffic engineer, in my opinion, the paradigm of single occupancy vehicles doing a mass commute twice a day is dead. So, um, It's very unclear right now whether there's going to be a clear winner or loser uh, for um, urban mobility after the pandemic. Um, first of all, because we don't know if there is an after the pandemic um, uh, and we don't know um, how long that's going to be uh, or what form it's going to take. So I don't want to you know, get too far ahead of myself and and speculate there. Um, I think it's clear that, that people are going to be looking for short-term alternatives that are safe. Um, one of the reasons I'm so bullish about um, these uh, elect automated bikes and scooters, you know, self-driving wheelchairs are a thing. Um, they're like Hitachi, which is one of the biggest manufacturers of wheelchairs, is working on self-driving wheelchairs. Um, you know, it will be difficult if and when airports get up and running for you to go to an airport in the next couple of years and not see a self-driving wheelchair. That'll be the first place where, where they're tested. Um, and the reason why I'm so I'm so bullish on those things is because not just because I think um, it will be safe, easy, and cheap to build automation into them. And it will support a lot of new kinds of business models that will make it easy. You know, if you thought Bird like came fast and furious, there are like a thousand more of those waiting once we figure out how to build automation into, into something that's small and cheap. Um, it, it's that it will give people the personal private mobility of an automobile without the impact of, of an automobile. And this is something that um, you know we first saw in China with SARS. Uh, I went to Shanghai in 2008 um, with a group of, of executives from a, a, a big auto manufacturer, and we spent some time travel, touring e-bike factories. And they all told us the same story, uh, which was that uh, when SARS hit, Chinese cities had not expanded their subway network yet to the dormitory neighborhoods outside the factory zones on the outskirts of cities where all the workers lived. So all those workers depended on buses to get into the factories. And when SARS hit, they didn't want to be on buses anymore. And all the bike manufacturers, uh, Shanghai and Beijing, but Shanghai was the first one, looked around and said, hey, maybe people will get back on bikes. And oh, wow, you know, this battery technology has gotten to the point where we can we can put a battery 
and a tiny motor on a bike for not that much money that a, a factory worker can afford, you know, to, to pay in installments, that they can go 15 to 20 kilometers in an hour and charge, you know, while they're working and then, and then get back home. And that's, that's how the global e-bike industry was born. It was born because, you know, working like Chinese factory workers needed a way to get to work uh, that didn't involve getting on the bus during, during a major epidemic. So I think, I think we're going to see those kinds of things come out of the woodwork. And that's where my attention is focused on right now, you know, as opposed to, well, <clears throat> you know, is mass transit going to survive or what can we do to fix mass transit or, you know, uh, should we be, should we be um, trying to, you know, deal with the devil and, and find a way to manage people uh, surging back to, to private automobiles, um, you know, and, and particularly for cities, I think that um, that's that's where the the answer lies. Right now in New York City, um, you know, we're in the midst of a somewhat bungled restart of the subway system, and I'm very anxious about um, the lack of manufacturing capacity for e-bikes, both locally and in the United States. All the supply chains for those things and, you know, or start depending on your point of view in China. Uh, and so I'm trying to get people to think about what do we really need to do and how fast can we beef up e-bike manufacturing in the U S and particularly in the New York city area. Um, because, you know, by the time September rolls around, the city's really back on its feet. You know, we could have hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people trying to get, you know, access to tens of thousands of e-bikes uh, to move great distances over the city because they don't want to be on the subway system. And, you know, the alternatives that they'll have, if that isn't in place, are not good uh, for the environment or for people's ability to earn, um, you know, or for, for congestion management. So I think, um, I think you know, in, in the short term, uh, we really need to be looking for flexible, cheap, rapidly deployable alternatives. Um, okay, so what's next? Okay, so I'm gonna skip uh, to a um, question by Dale Dvorak. What are the safety concerns and can they be, oh, it just disappeared. Uh, if they can they be mitigated if everyone a downtown area was required to use one instead of having a mix between cars with drivers and driverless cars so these are all great questions um, this is this is a particularly interesting one because um, there's so much divergence of opinion on this um, what has happened in the tech industry as um, I think companies trying to build driverless vehicles for use in urban areas have started to realize just how complex uh, the environments are. Um, and particularly if they want to, you know, reduce risk, like how many, how many times they'll have to, to stop the vehicle is that they're looking for more separation. Okay. Um, with a separated roadways or separated lanes or, um, you know, having driverless vehicles, operate in settings where they're only around human beings and pedestrians, but not around other human driven vehicles. Uh, this is what Sidewalk Labs proposed for their project in Toronto. And in many ways, this, this goes directly against what the urban planners are saying is the best practice, which is that you should mix everything up, cars, buses, bikers, cyclists, but always put the most vulnerable users of the street at the top of the pyramid and everything is designed around their needs. So pedestrians, cyclists, and then, you know, everything else. Um, and let AVs sort of wade into that as they're, um, as they're ready. And that has been, you know, my, um, my stance is I, I sort of go with, uh, let's not, lose sight of our mobility principles that have been built up over decades 
Uh, let's make AVs fit into that. There's no reason to rush this technology forward to change the city to make that happen, particularly as I was saying, when there isn't like a huge compelling public interest to do so. The one exception I'm gonna make to that though is about moving freight. And I think I think that um, I think that the way to handle that though isn't necessarily with space, but with time. And uh, you know, automation opens up all of the idle hours uh, that streets just lay empty um, to to do things. Um, and particularly when you think about automated electric vehicles, which are quite quiet, or you know, can be programmed to move quite slowly, um, you know, uh, could be could be very quiet and very safe. And so one of the scenarios that I, I play out in the book is like, you know, future cities might, a, a really defining characteristic of them might be that the, the late, you know, the wee hours of the morning are full of this kind of slow motion ballet of, of, um, robo vehicles essentially restocking and taking the waste out um doing all the cleaning and and tidying up and and deliveries uh, so that they don't have to burden the streets during the day with those activities what makes it practical is when you think about automating the receiving end of that as well um, and so you don't have to have a night watchman there to receive the delivery. One robot can just port with the other robot and put it right into the refrigerator or the waste is there and it can be put right into the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the trash truck robot and it can, it can drive off. Um, and those kinds of things are, they're totally solvable technology problems. They're a million times easier to solve than, you know, teaching a Tesla to drive through a busy urban neighborhood. Um, and I think, I think we're slowly, you know, going to figure that out and cities are going to, are, are already starting to realize that they want to encourage these kinds of things because it will, it will allow them to, to achieve all the goals that they have for, you know, creating lively streets during the day, but also, you know, providing all the services that they want to provide. Uh, the one other thing, too, I want to say about that, um, and it's probably one of my favorite parts of the book in terms of um, coming up with a, a new perspective uh, and opening my eyes to, to what the future might hold. Um, you know, we really talk about driverlessness as if it's like a binary switch that's going to be flipped. So we, you know, have a human-driven car and we're going to take it to the dealer and trade it in and we're gonna get a fully computer driven one and we're never gonna to touch a thing again. Um, you know, that starts to get a little bit more complicated when we talk about the different levels of automation that the automotive engineering societies have defined. Um, in reality, there's a lot of reasons why we're gonna skip most of those. Um, but the fact is, there's so many different things that drivers do and um, especially commercial drivers and it's really only a very small number of them that are being automated. Um, and even when we do automate the actual operation of the vehicle as it moves down the road, um, we may not automate all of the functions or we may simply shift some of them to another location or we may aggregate them in new ways. So a lot of uh, the interesting stuff that's happening in uh, commercial fleet automation and trucking is it um, uh, companies are, are developing systems where you know you may have one operator who has like six trucks and they're watching all six of them from from you know the, the piloting center wherever that is and the trucks are just calling home when they get confused and when they need permission um, so yeah can i can i overtake this car you know, on a, on a dark curve with some sketchy paint markings and the operator will say, oh, of course not, you know, or, oh yeah, uh, there's a car stopped on a bridge and it's, uh, you know, I'm in the middle of nowhere. Can I go around it? Uh, yeah, looks good, go ahead. Um, and the, you know, the, the system may actually learn from that 
and not ask permission the next time because it's learned enough to know that it's safe. Um, there are uh, like so so um, some of the uh, roboticists are um, looking at uh, operating modes where um, you know, the machine does most of the uh, controls itself, the gross motor controls, uh, like it will get the robot to the work site, but then a human being will come over and do the, um, or call in and do the fine grained manipulation of the, the hands or the pinchers. Um, and so the point I'm trying to make is that self-driving and driverlessness isn't gonna be zero and one, it's not gonna be on and off. It's gonna be like this, this gray zone of all these different kinds of behaviors. Um, you know, the, the, like, the other uh, way I talked about it in the book is like, you know, you're gonna have hot rodders who just wanna focus on the throttle and have the computer do everything else. You're gonna have like people like me who are like Prius hypermilers, where I'm just gonna be zero focused on, you know, how do I get this thing to be as fuel efficient as possible? I don't care about anything else. The computer can do all the other driving. I just wanna, I wanna be hyper, doing that hypermiling. Um, you know, or people with kids who may just want to have full control over the defensive driving aspect, but leave the rest of it. So like disaggregating the driving function and having software do parts of it um, is going to be something that's going to have tremendous consumer appeal. And it's, it's going to make this thing look a lot more, you know, like, um, uh, you know, the variety of apps that you have on your phone rather than just like, oh, you know, it's a smartphone, a dumb phone. No, it's a smartphone that is like a Swiss army knife with these 87,000 different things it can do for you. Uh, and I think that's, that's the way we're gonna, we're gonna look at it. Uh, okay, next question, David Malcolm. Uh, it seems that there's nothing that cannot be hacked. How can we you avoid this with driverless cars? Um, that's, uh, you know, incredibly frightening question. So I don't know if any of you, um, this afternoon I was thinking, well, what, what, what can we talk about today uh, that will connect this to actually what's going on in the world? Um, and uh, as I was thinking about that, a really disturbing scene from, I believe it was Minneapolis, it may have been somewhere in Texas and Houston or Dallas, of a like large fuel delivery truck, tractor trailer, barreling uh, along an interstate highway uh, into an area of a protest march. And thankfully everyone got out of the way and thankfully also restrained themselves from taking, taking out their frustration <laughs> and fear, um, you know, on this guy for what he had done. But, um, you know, it got me thinking, like um, that's a that's a great example of where automation uh, is gonna is gonna change you know what a scene like this might play out like in the future. Um, and I've I've spoken I didn't I didn't put any of this material in the book because um, I, I think it wasn't quite mature yet. But um, when I started doing the research on the book was when a lot of the truck attacks were happening in Europe. And, um, you know, people were very rarely making the connection, not only that um, more, more connectivity and more automation in commercial trucks would allow for sort of kill switches and other kinds of, of things that would allow those attacks to either be prevented or stopped in progress. Um, but people were thinking about the flip side which was what if you took a attack strategy like a distributed denial of service attack that's that's used online where you know which like this is vastly oversimplifying it but where you you unleash a network of computers to overwhelm a target by sending lots and lots of messages to it lots of requests to it uh, at the same time, you know, what if that attack strategy were unleashed using, say, like a fleet of automated trucks and, you know, you sent 100 tractor trailers steaming full blast into like a major building in a city or something, 
Um, that's like an incredibly frightening possibility. And I find it very unlikely that, um, well, let me strike that because I actually find it, I find it pretty likely that, that a, um, a company could get to a point where something like that would be possible without, uh, you know, the, the people, the important people in government who ought to understand that risk and be trying to prevent it actually having a handle on it. I think it's something that would probably have to actually occur before we went back and fixed it. And so that, that risk is real. Um, as I said before, freight, I think, is something that we're going to see move along. Long haul trucking is something that we're going to see get automated very quickly because there's, there's just lots of reasons to do it. Um, and the technology is somewhat easier. Um, there's at least a half dozen startups that are working in this space right now. Um, and, um, you know, so that's like, that's like a major, um, cybersecurity risk that needs to start, um, start getting planned for. So it's those kinds of things that, that, um, or, you know, it's like a present situation we're in, um, like imagine it was 2030 and all of this happened and, you know, the U S most of our trucking network was automated. So we're in this incredibly vulnerable position. Our supply lines are really stretched to the max already because of pandemic, because of, of civil unrest. And one of our geopolitical adversaries decides to just press a little bit harder, uh, you know, by throwing, throwing some stress on, uh, you know, on our automated uh, trucking network through, through a cyber uh, attack. Um, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that is incredibly frightening. Um, and I think, I think those, those are the kinds of things that, um, will, will get attention and money before, um, the kinds of, of stunts that, um, we see with like, you know, people hacking into cars and making them accelerate. There's very, very good product liability reasons that companies will, will do their best to make sure that doesn't happen. It won't prevent everything, but like those kinds of things will put General Motors out of business or Toyota out of business or cost them, you know, so much that it's in their interest. So I worry less about that. Uh, I worry a lot more about the sort of systemic changes. Let's go to the next question. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure how much time we have left. Is there any way to check in on how much time we have left? Anyways, I'll, I'll keep going. If someone can make something come up on my screen. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, okay. Uh, how do you see the governing of self-driving cars working out? So this is Candace's question or comment. Uh, will it be city by city allowing this tech with various restrictions or state by state? Uh, so in the United States, uh, there are some things that are regulated that are relevant at state level. Well, some that are national. So all the consumer safety stuff, um, you know, uh, like seat belts is federally regulated. Um, how cars are made, um, crash test regulations, that kind of stuff. That's all federal. States have jurisdiction over licensing. Um, and cities, municipalities mostly have regulation over traffic laws. Um, they, uh, so I spent a lot of time working with cities through Bloomberg Philanthropies from 2017 to 2019. Uh, and that was really, that work was what um, planted the seed for, for this book. Um, and, um, you know, the way cities, I think, are going to, I think cities are going to be crucial because the reasons, the reasons I said, cars aren't going to be the big market, I think, for automated mobility. I think it's going to be a whole range of different products and a whole range of different services that are built on those products. And so um, cities are going to be important because 
it's really going to be a business of niches, right? It's going to be sort of like a long tail business. Um, and cities have the most diverse, you know, markets. It's going to be, if you identify a market segment of, you know, like young hipsters who want like autonomous skateboards, you're going to go to a city to find them and, and develop the solution and, you know, work with the city government to figure out how to get it, uh, to get it rolled out. That is sort of what's happened with, with ride hail and scooters. They didn't start out in like a real um, cooperative kind of operating mode with cities, but they eventually got there to where they were working with cities. Uh, and I have a good friend, Sasha Hassemeyer, um, who's working uh, on trying to understand what these market entry mechanisms are for mobility companies to come into cities and, um, you know, as opposed to just showing up and breaking the law. Um, and how cities, rather than just reacting to this market entry by companies, a very aggressive market entry, to actually create the, the rules or the conditions uh, or the channels by which cities, uh, mobility innovators can come into cities with, with their new offerings. And so I think that's like gonna be the big turnaround in the next couple of years that starts to make this stuff like feel a little bit more comfortable and, and make the process a little bit easier rather than having stuff, you know, like scooters ending up all over the sidewalks and, and people getting angry about it and um, having to, to sort of go back to the, the beginning and figure out how to make it work. Um, and I think that'll also be the interesting thing about it. And the good thing about it is that, you know, it's not just going to be one product like a, you know, a seven by 18, 2000 pound, 500 horsepower thing. Um, and, uh, you know, it's going to be vehicles that are sort of right sized for the, the situation and the, and the, the use. Um, and that's really great. Um, this is about breaking down the box of the automobile into the pieces that actually fit into cities and, and are aligned with like what cities want out of mobility. So I think it's a technology that fundamentally puts cities in control and I'm really excited uh, about helping them figure out how to make the most of it. So, uh, so let's go to the next question. What are the so-called promises of the driverless car reduction of traffic? Concomitant decrease or elimination of the need for parking lots and even street right of way. Strikes me as anti urbanist rather than rise of a green paradise. What will happen not only to physical urban form, but what is the effect on the public sphere? As this is uh, Elizabeth um Umban Hoar. So that's a great question. I have a whole chapter in the book that's devoted to answering this. Um, chapter eight is called Urban Machines. Um, one of the things that's different about Ghost Road than Smart Cities, the, the first book, is that it's, it's not a book about cities, but it is an urban favorite book. Um, it's, really, it's really about technology, it's a book about mobility, and it's a, it's, it's a sort of urban flavored book about technology and mobility. Um, and um, I mean, I think that the parking discussion is, is fascinating. Um, there have been a lot of really interesting design experiments over the last couple of years to try to figure out like, what are we gonna do with all this, this excess parking, um, you know, that's left over in cities and where are we gonna put the parking uh, that, we, that we still do need for automated vehicles, knowing that they, you know, can probably drive themselves off to like satellite parking lots. They don't need to park right next to wherever it is they've dropped, you know, their owner. Uh, and uh, or if they're shared fleets, you know, the people that are that are using them. And so, um, you know, that creates like a tremendous amount of excitement in urban planning and design community, because if you look at like someplace like Los Angeles, um, you know, if you can repurpose all the land that's devoted to parking and automobile, not, not even just a street land. I mean, you can, you can solve most of the housing affordability problems, uh, you know, in Southern California. 
um, just by unleashing that land for development. And there's been some really detailed studies that have been, been done of this. Um, and so I think what that's doing is really just, it's like a carrot um, that's being held out that's, that's saying, look, cities, all the things that you've been trying to do with density and housing and mixed use, reducing auto dependency, those are still the right things to do and might be even more right down the road um, if automated driverless uh, pans out, you know, the way, the way we're being promised. Um, there's a lot of other kooky ideas out there, um, you know, about like uh, one-way streets and reducing like the width of lanes. And I, I think anyone that tells you that they know what the street of the future should be laid out like or like the perfect the design for the street of the future is really like lying to you. Um, there are, however, like thoughtful, there's thoughtful guidance out there about like what the principles for future streets ought to be. Um, and what I write about quite a bit in the book is, is a group called NACTO, which is essentially like the club of city transportation officials. In, in the US and Canada. And um, what's really interesting, they published this thing called the Blueprint for Autonomous Urbanism. And it's, it's consistent with the things they've been saying about cities, streets before autonomous came along, um, you know, that they should be shared and pedestrians should be given priority. You know, automobiles should really be at the bottom of the pecking order when it comes to how we, how we plan streets. Um, but, um, like half of the recommendations are about software and it's kind of a crazy thing to have a bunch of transportation planners coming out and saying, well, look, you know, this is, this is really the way we're going to shape the city of the future. The street of the future is by getting the software. Right. And um, it's, it's one of the first like really strong, really clear and actually very specific kinds of visions I've seen like that. Uh, to come out of any urban planning organization ever. Um, and I really, you know, if, if you're interested in this, I encourage you to take a look at it. it it's, they're essentially like saying, okay, we're going to design the street of the future by designing the regulations, which isn't that radical of an idea. Um, it's, it actually, you know, makes a lot of sense. Um, but then they're saying, but the way that we are going to enforce those regulations is by making these requirements for the vehicles and the services that operate on the streets. And we're gonna have our software talk to their software to make sure that that's how they actually do it. Um, and I, I think it's, it's pretty visionary and has the potential to give cities a lot more leverage. So, you know, they might be able to do things like no deliveries when there's people around. And they just make that the policy and there's some sensor that can detect, you know, when there are pedestrians on the street and just constantly ward off the delivery vehicles or, you know, charge them congestion fees to get in and justify interfering with pedestrian life. Um, you know, and, 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 this, and the result, the desired result of that being that companies deliver at night, you know, late at night. Um, and, and there's just endless permutations on, on what they could do once they have the ability to write regulations and code and, um, and push that out into the marketplace and incentivize different users of, of the street network to, um, to change their behavior. And it's, it's super exciting, the possibilities there. Um, okay. Uh, Will W says, you flashed an intriguing slide when atoms behave like bits. Can you share the content behind that slide? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the idea there is, is basically, um, I was really um, trying to understand, you know, if, if, if we're doing, if we're focusing on the wrong thing by, by thinking about how the way we get around will be changed by driverless vehicles, 
And what we ought to be looking at is how the way our stuff gets around will be changed by driverless vehicles. How much is that going to change? And um, there's some really good work in the economics literature that looks at like the, the price per ton mile, I guess is how they measure it, uh, of shipping something has changed throughout the course of the 20th century. And it's, it's really just been like a steady sort of rocketing decline. You know, I think it costs like 90% less to ship something, a ton of bulk stuff across the country than it did 100 years ago. Um, you know, and that's sort of roughly um, the same like throughout, um, you know, whether you're shipping it like across the country or across, across town. Well, what if automation drops that by like another 90%? And it's like as easy and as cheap to send a box of something across town as it is to send a text message. Um, what does the world start to look like then? And what kinds of things do people start to do with that? And um, around the time I was thinking of that, I started looking at what was going on in China with delivery. And like China basically went through the U.S.'s 20th century experience with this decline in shipping costs and the increased speed in, in shipping in like 10 years. So like when Alibaba started, it took, you know, it took like three weeks to ship something from from their, uh, their headquarters, which I think is in Suzhou, outside Shanghai, to, you know, to Wuhan or another, another big city on the other side of China. And 10 years later, you know, that was like a 24 hour thing. And you've got, you know, Alibaba has 5 million, Baidu has like 2 million, and JD, like, or sorry, Alibaba has 5, JD has 2 million. Like, you can deliver anything in any Chinese city and like, under 24 hours um, and you know like on something like singles day uh, which is like a big you know gift giving holiday in China I can't even remember what the numbers are they're so staggering it's like you know a billion packages in 24 hours or 5 billion it's 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 in the book it's just such a staggering number I can't even remember it but like um, so so that kind of growth and that kind of disruptive shift like what it what it means for um, for uh, how we shop and our neighborhoods look like. Um, and you know, what intrigued me was like thinking beyond what we're experiencing now, which is just, oh, it just means Amazon shoveling more crap off the web down our throats and you know, sort of furthering this big boxification of, of retailing that started you know, with Walmart 20, 30 years ago and it's just snowballed. Like, what if it means, um, you know, that like my kids who are really into baking can team up <clears throat> with someone who's got a big network of, of uh, potential customers or is willing to do the decorating or, you know, like that we could start to build like supply chains locally um, using this cheap distribution um, you know, whether there's other economic modes that might start to um, start to develop based on that. And so that's actually a lot of the, the research work that I'm doing now is developing um, scenarios uh, that are trying to understand, like, how we avoid what's happening right now, locking us into this future of what they call the last mile that leg of the delivery between the, the local depot and your home that's just completely dominated by a handful of global companies um, and try to think about more cooperative, um, potentially publicly supported, potentially peer, um, peer types of, of models for moving goods cheaply around local communities and what the role of automation could be in in making that possible and driving that cost down. Um, and you know, what it really comes down to at the end of the day is that I think if we allow the technology for automated delivery um, to be dominated and, and controlled exclusively by a handful of companies like Amazon and Google and Baidu, like that's gonna be really bad uh, for local economic development.
that um, we need to find ways for um, postal systems and, you know, like business improvement districts and even municipal operators. Um, so, I mean, as an idea, I mean, like, what if, what if Seattle, you know, like it did a hundred years ago, like was able to somehow either establish or start or take control over, you know, its own local uh, automated delivery network um, and offer that service to anybody who wanted to use it at a fair rate that allowed it to cover its costs. It didn't privilege, you know, its its own business partners. It didn't do all of the anti-competitive things that Amazon does with its marketplace customers. And, you know, it really just became like a utility um, that allowed uh, small businesses you know, to, to connect to, them, to each other and to, to their customers. Um, that's kind of what's at stake. And I think it's, it's a really um, big struggle that I, you know, I was writing about, like, as we were going to be lining up for that battle five or 10 years from now. And, uh, you know, right now, seeing Amazon and Walmart s- sort of duking it out is actually <clears throat> a little reassuring that maybe there's still some bit of competitiveness left uh, in that space. Um, but, uh, you know, like where, where is that third, that third model that, uh, you know, might, might allow for some, some other features to unfold. Um, it was Minneapolis. Oh, good. Uh, let's see, what have we got left? Future driverless trucking. I'm going to, I think I talked about that. I'm going to let that one go. Um, how will privacy work with driverless cars, considering the Patriot Act let government tamper with our internet? So um, this is something I write about like quite a bit in the, in the beginning of the book. Um, the the in, interior... So I, I don't think you have to know a lot about automated vehicles to know that the exterior of these things are really riddled with sensors, um, cameras, radar, LIDAR, laser scanners um, that are constantly collecting data about what's around them. And, you know, it's, it's hard to really get a clear sense of how much of that data is analyzed and then sort of discarded and just the results of the analysis are kept. So like, you know, if I take a picture of you walking down the street, I'm a self-driving car, do I just scan it and see if anything's relevant and then chuck it, or do I actually just save it? Um, so, so that's a big risk. Um, and I think that's something that people are thinking about, and there's been a lot of interesting studies of. But the truth is that there's far more surveillance of what's going on inside the vehicle. And if you, if you dig down and think about why does Google why does Baidu in, in China, why does Yandex, which is Russia's biggest search engine, why are these companies funding the development of self-driving vehicles? And why were they the first in and why are they so aggressive and so far ahead? And it's because it's, it's the future of computers for them. <clears throat> I mean, this is, this is the mobile phone 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, we're going to spend more of our time and essentially, it's like, it, I, I like to tease people to say that, you know, what's it feel like to drive a Tesla? Well, it feels like driving an iPad, right? Like it's a computer that you get inside of. And once you're inside a computer, it's just constantly scanning you. And it's going to sneak in through, through some sort of interesting ways. So, you know, I, I write about this in the book that like a lot of the way that um, car companies are going to deal with the issue of driver attention during this transition from human driven to partial to full is to monitor you with cameras to tell whether you're paying attention or not. And the argument I, I make is like, even after they switch to full automation, those cameras aren't going anywhere. They're, they're gonna stay. And instead they're gonna be basically profiling you for, for advertising um, and, and other kinds of, of, you know, essentially, again, why are search companies interested in this? because this is the biggest captive media audience for, for search and for ads that has ever been created in the history of mankind. Um, I mean, people inside automated vehicles 
on endless commutes uh, because you know your 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 sensitivity to to distance and travel time and your willingness to, to tolerate traffic is probably going to be reduced when you don't have to to drive and you can use the time productively. Like it, it's 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 like an incredible future opportunity for them. Um, so you are primed to receive whatever it is that they want to pitch to you. And so I think that, that that's, that's really the, the nut of it is that they see it as the, the future of media, the future of computing. Um, and like the inside of the car is where the action is. I mean, it's, it's no coincidence. Like Disney has a group already working on what that in car media experience is going to be like. Um, and trying to understand it and trying to shape it and trying to figure out ways to, 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 to get in on it. Um, and I think that's all well and good. There's a lot of value for consumers there, but when it starts to get iffy is when you start thinking about like, okay, well, you know, we're in a future world where everything's automated. Let's say you're no longer allowed to drive a human driven vehicle anymore. And, um, you know, wealthy people have their own private, self-driving vehicles where they, you know, turn, turn the internal surveillance off. Um, you know, it's essentially a cloak. Like they go in there and they're, they're just in a bubble moving through, through the world, uh, a protected bubble. Um, and then you have people who, you know, can't afford that and have to travel in shared vehicles, whatever's, you know, the future equivalent of Uber, which is probably like a very down market thing. And it's probably supported by advertising revenue. And once you step into a vehicle like that, I mean, you're just you're just being scanned constantly, um, and you know you're paying with you're, you're you're really performing for your ride in a lot of ways. And there's just tremendous inequities, um, you know, in, in a scenario like that. And it's it's not at all far uh, far from reality. I mean, in, in many ways, it's just the business model for the web ported over to urban mobility. Um, and so I don't think it's crazy to speculate about that as, as kind of terrible as it sounds. Um, I think that's all the questions. But um, if anybody has anything else to throw up in the, the chat board or uh, elsewhere, I think we can probably call it a night. Yeah, um, thanks so much, Anthony. I'm Candice. Uh, nice Hi, to meet you for a moment here. Um, thanks so much for your talk tonight. It's very interesting, um, particularly the history. I think it's easy to think that all of this is um, so modern, but it's interesting to see that it's uh, actually not. Um, I want to thank everybody for watching tonight as well. Um, if you're interested in more um, coming town hall events, um, you can follow this channel by clicking the follow button at the top right of your screen. Um, please support Third Place Books tonight if you're interested in, in buying a copy of Anthony's book. Um, hit that buy the book button at the bottom uh, of the Crowdcast channel uh, screen. Um, and if you're so inclined, um, you can donate to Town Hall via this uh, page or whichever page you are watching on. Um, Thanks again, and um, we'll see you next time.